I'm a big believer in co-creation. So when you go into a co-creation situation, you're more likely to, to not know what might come out of it at the end. Mm. So things can emerge out of, out of discussions, things can emerge out of being uncomfortable and not really knowing. No one wants to be out of their comfort zone. I mean, even if you say, oh, I like being out of my comfort zone, of course you don't. Like I would say that as well, but then of course I don't like it either, <laughs> but I'm committed to wanting to do it. Yeah. I really want to co-create. Creativity in chaos is actually exciting. Thank you so much for joining me, Heather, for our next episode of Be The Drop. Mm, thank you. It's an absolute pleasure to be here in Fringe Headquarters. <laughs> Things are just hotting up for you, I'm sure. Yes. To get us started, though, just to set a little bit of scene, give us a bit of context about how long you've been in the Fringe and you know sure. what it means to you. Can you share your item of significance? So I've brought um, a poster of Shoot the Fringe. So Shoot the Fringe um, was an open access film festival that I used to run back in 1990 as part of the Fringe, which in itself is an open access festival as well. Yeah. So it was a shoot to show Super 8 festival. Yeah. So what that means is that I used to give out rolls of Super 8 and they're three minutes each, the old rolls, mm. with, you know, yeah. were tick through the camera. And we used to, um, give them out on day one of the fringe and people had one week to roll, shoot the roll. Oh, no editing because just whatever you shoot is what's in the film. And then they give it back to me and then we would set up a big screen outside mm. at the fringe for the mm. final week and we would show the results. Yeah. And everyone who'd made the films would come, everyone who was in the films and, yeah. you know, so on. So thousands of people would come and watch the films and they were brilliant. The reason I chose the Shoot the Fringe poster to bring was because it embodied, um, you know, a number of the strands of what's happened in my career, which is a lot of filmmaking and a lot of festival producing. Oh, what a fantastic introduction to you. Thank you so much, Heather, <laughs> because what a great concept, you know, sending mm. out these films mm. and then not knowing you know yeah. what you're going to get <laughs> yeah. and bringing it together and showing them yeah what it was that, so and fun. that seems to me like the real height of fringe yeah and this you mentioned mm. open access yeah. you know and having the importance of open as, mm. access festivals so could you talk to us a little bit more about that you yeah. know what what does that mean to mm. artists and the audiences that come the the Adelaide fringe was born as a sort of an act of defiance from artists really like the brave artists that so the Adelaide Festival was launched in 1960 and in the lead up to that festival um, it was clear that most of the program would be international artists in the program and um, that was a celebration of bringing the arts world to Adelaide. Well local artists were like well why aren't we in the festival what are we you know how can we be in the festival and so then they said well you know we'll, we'll do our own festival on the fringe of the festival yeah. and the 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 whole ethos of what they created was anyone could be in it so people talk about disruptive business like yeah. people talk about Uber, disruptive technology uh, and, yeah. airbnb as the disruptor i mean the the fringe is like the original disruptor like 60 <laughs> years ago like if you think about most festival models most are top down yeah. and that that curation is happening by the director who's going around and selecting work and i think some people that don't quite understand what the open access model of the fringe is you know they say to me oh how do you choose everything and it's like I don't no. because how could I choose 1,300 shows? <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck. Like, <laughs> and uh, we all own it together. I mean, I'm just custodian looking after, trying to meet, bring bring in new systems for ticketing and making sure the marketing is going well or what, you know, just overseeing, making sure that artists are happy and things like that. But I'm not programming the festival. And our duty is to make sure that, um, I mean, our mission is to make sure that um, artists find an audience so we do everything in our power to make sure that the most tickets are sold mm. so when people say oh do you want the fringe to get bigger and bigger um, no I don't want the fringe to get bigger and bigger 
what I want to get bigger is the ticket sales. I mm. want more and more ticket sales for those artists. So um, we sell the tickets on behalf of the artists and then they get given their box office settlement at the end. And last year we sold 700,000 tickets, which means we uh, make up almost 40% of in, or the entire nation's arts festival tickets is at Adelaide Fringe. Wow. So most festivals that are really successful sell, you know, 50,000, 60,000. That's a great number of ticket sales. Mm. But we're selling 700,000. That's massive. It's massive. <laughs> it massive. And it's hard to get your head around. But yeah. it's because of that accumulative audience. It's because a lot of people come to Fringe who don't go to art stuff during the year. Mm. So we hope that out of those 700,000 tickets that lots of artists are walking away with a great box office settlement and, and, and opportunities. Obviously not everybody does no. because we have 1,300 shows mm. um, and so lots of people walk away with a great box office settlement. Some walk away with okay, others, you know, walk away with a, with a loss. Artists do the open access model for all sorts of reasons. Yeah. Some of them do it for the box office. Some of them will do it because they're hoping to get picked up and go on tour. Um, some are doing it to try a new show out and that's literally all they're trying to do is just test it on an audience. Others are doing it because actually they, they don't even have a professional intention to do this show anywhere else, but because the Fringe exists and it's so um, it's so inviting and so inclusive, they jump on and that's their one time of the year that they do something creative in this way and they might work as, you know, something else for the rest of the year. Mm. The other thing um, about the, the Fringe here is we're the second oldest in the world, so... The original Fringe was Edinburgh Fringe mm. and a few years later was Adelaide. So we're the second oldest and in all those decades we have remained as the second largest. So there's nearly 300 Fringe festivals now. Most of them are less than 10 years old. Mm. 300 Fringe festivals, mm. yeah, that is an explosion. <laughs> yeah. The other reason that we, you know, are able to hold that title really is because um, we support the artists in so many different ways that, other festivals might not be able to devote those resources like doing our marketplace, um, doing a big artist services department, running what we call a fringe club, which is a ba basically a great meeting point for artists to meet each other, to be, um, you know, set up with meetings for people that might book their show for a tour. So all these elements of the fringe are what helps us um, retain that that position in the fringe table of the world. And you have been instrumental in developing a really strong relationship with the Edinburgh mm. Festival, yeah. which is, you know, the, the, mm. the oldest and the largest. Mm. So, you know, can you talk us through some of the benefits mm. for the, you know, that relationship yeah. between the two fringe festivals? Yeah, so it's not that long ago um, that if you wanted to register in the fringe, you had to fill in a form and drop it off or post it to the office, you know. I mean, it's not that long ago. Internet's not that old. So fringe has been going for many decades when it was still all by paper. <laughs> and um, and then around about, you know, the 2000, late 90s, the fringe, you know, gets a website, you know. And, um, and so then email comes along as well. So, you know, emails... Um, and the website, that, that was a big change for Fringe sort of model. So then you start to have to build online forms. It all sounds so basic now, but these were big revolutionary moments, you know, for <laughs> open access because then yeah. you didn't have to walk around and knock on the doors of all the venues and hand out flyers to encourage them to be a Fringe venue. Um, they could just register on their, um, you mm. know, with an email or, you know, whatever. What we've done in the last few years, and Edinburgh and Adelaide have really led the way in this stuff, is um, taken a lot of that stuff and built quite sophisticated digital platforms to help match, match you know, it's like Tinder of yeah. <laughs> artists and venues. We're trying to match them up, you know. And so we've made it so it's really user-friendly. Artists can just register your, on their mobile. When they're on the bus on the way home, they can just, mm. you know, we've made a very user-friendly system. And, again, that's about us trying to help service the artists better and, and to listen to what they say, what they want, mm. and then try and build it in, in, yeah. you know, in downtime during the, during the <laughs> months when we're not delivering the festival. And that's um, something that we also do a lot of knowledge sharing with Edinburgh on as well. How can we make the 
marketplace as useful as possible for the artists and, you mm. know, sharing things like that. So with the ticketing, um, it's complex. It gets a bit complex. But with ticketing, the normal thing with ticketing is that um, a ticket is split in different sort of chunks. So there's a chunk for the booking fee. There's a chunk for what's called inside fees, which helps with all the cost of ticketing systems and staff and things like that. Then there's a chunk for the promoter, the artist, the venue. You know, I mean, you slice it all up in different ways. There's no particular way to do that. Um, but we revolutionised last year our ticketing um, set up with, for Fringe Artists, which was that we zeroed the inside fee, which is one of the first, we're one of the first in the world to do that. Mm. And the reason we did that is because we're constantly trying to make sure that the position for the artist at the end of the season is the best that it can possibly be. Yeah. And not not just to artists. I mean, we have to listen to the audience who are very, everyone has an opinion on <laughs> how the ticketing should be. And I hope this year when we go on sale, people will notice that we've improved our, um, how to navigate the fringe because obviously that's a big challenge. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's people get overwhelmed when they yes. see a 1,000 shows. But then what we've been trying to do more and more in the new systems is um, how do we make it so that you can find what you would want yeah. to find um, how can we make it so that it's kind of like your personalized fringe you know you can add your favorites you can you know all sorts of things that you can do so that you don't have to keep going back to the thousand shows you can start to create a diary mm. you'll be able to now go on to our thing and say well on the second Saturday of the festival I know I'm going to meet up with some friends I know we're going to be in the um western side of the city I want to minimize my search on the fringe website to be shows that start between 7 p.m on this day a seven and nine on this day and I need it to be in this particular area of Adelaide mm. so we can like keep like it's all about just just cutting out the things that don't match your search um and also the th um the other thing that people do in the fringe is they go to see shows last minute with no planning. Mm. And so we've now got this um, function that says near me now. So what's near oh, me now great. starting in half an hour, what's near me now starting in an hour. And then we've also done things like I'm in the mood to, you know, think, I'm in the mood to mm. laugh, I'm in mm. the mood. So you can start to almost get the, um, the the site to tell you some ideas rather than you. And we've also got um, if you like this show, you might like that show. So that sort of Amazon feature that's, you know, everyone's mm. so used to now. Um, artists, we've asked artists to recommend three or four shows. So if you go in now on a um, fringe artist and um, so Judith Lucy is our ambassador, for example, this year, or, or Matt Gilbertson, or you know anyone that's in the show, in the fringe. Um, they um, have listed a few shows that they think that if you like their show, then why don't you go and try this one? Mm. So recommendations are, are really powerful. So we've well, we've also implemented on the website now top tens for sort of influencers of Adelaide, so people that are on the radio or on the telly, presenters around, people or journalists, people that people think, oh, well, what would that, per you know, what's that person's mm. um, top ten? Word of mouth is so powerful with the Fringe. A lot of people wait. They don't buy so many tickets in advance. They, 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 we do sell a lot of tickets in advance. For the big acts, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, for things that people have heard of or things that they know of, but a lot of people wait. And as soon as that word of mouth uh, kicks off the season goes like build and so you mentioned word of mouth as a powerful communication mm. tool what are the other streams that you've really built on to help spread the message and you know mm. grow the communication of the fringe our social media platforms have really exploded in the last few years um we i mean we we've got an attitude of like well let's go to where the people are I mean, we know that our website is a hugely busy website as well, which is brilliant, um, and we've worked hard on that. That's not an accident. We've um, we've really pushed the idea that the adelaidefringe.com.au is the site that you go to search and buy tickets and so on. Um, but we also have taken the approach of let's go to where the people are. 
So the people are on Instagram, the people are on Facebook, you know, where, uh, what can we do on that platform that isn't just marketing and buy tickets, buy tickets, because people don't respond well to that. So we try to create a conversation on our social media platforms that makes people engaged and makes people, um, you know, get involved in commenting and having discussions. And um, we've launched a membership program which is going really well and building a fat you know building the fringe family is uh, been a big big focus for us mm, mm. and and one other thing and you've sort of touched on this really but I know that you collect a lot of stats and data around mm. the performance of the fringe you know what would you say has been the main because we've you've talked a lot about the benefits to the artist mm. but obviously you know this this world um, stage that's yeah. happening here in Adelaide has benefits to the state as yes, well. Yes, absolutely. So what, you know, what are the sort of key benefits on that state platform as well? Yeah, data and analytics now. It's just like the thing that you just, you know, everyone expects you to collect loads of data and not just collect data but to make some sense of it mm. and to put it in context. And, you know, we're, we're collecting, you know, how many tickets did we sell, um, what box, so we sold $16 million worth of tickets last year. That's amazing. It's isn't massive. It? It's and, great. And so, um, you know, pretty much most of that, apart from the booking fee clip, because we've zeroed the inside fees, um, most of that is going, that's an injection of, you know, over $15 million into the arts and the venues. So that's just amazing. That's mm. more than, you know, some government arts <laughs> budgets, you know. Um, so, so that's 700 that, And then what we do then is we give all this stuff to um, an economist who for the last 10 years has been measuring our economic impact on the state and the gross expenditure that we generate. So we, he says the last year we generated $90 million of gross expenditure to the state and that we attracted nearly $30 million of new money and new money is tourist money, mm. tourist spend. That's another thing where we're learning from Edinburgh because Edinburgh focused on their tourist growth some years ago and it might seem like a funny thing to focus on as a target, you know, oh, we want more tourists. It, it, but actually it has a huge knock-on effect for the artists, the venues, all the businesses mm. and everything about yeah, Fringe. Yeah. Absolutely. It makes complete sense. Yeah. And they're great numbers. Fantastic. Unbelievable. Yeah. And actually, you know, now we also collect the data around our marketplace that I told you about before, the, mm. the deals that are done in the marketplace. We know that uh, over $2 million worth of deals for touring were signed um, this year in mm. Fringe and that there was about another $2 million in discussion the last time we checked, which was a few months ago. Mm. So that could, you know, we could have generated about $4 million worth of touring deals. Yeah. Um, and that's what's great there is, you know, a lot of like wonderful uh, percentage are South Australian. So um, you get uh, groups like Gravity and Other Myths who have done so well from the marketplace in Adelaide Fringe um, had bookings all over the world. They've been touring for years now, you know, um, lots and lots of people who have had lots of, you know, um, Hans, you know, yeah. great uh, results out of the marketplace as well. Um, so around about a third of the deals in the marketplace in Adelaide Fringe are done by South Australian artists and then a third interstate and a third overseas. So which, you know, that's kind of healthy because it means that we um, we can attract more and more of those people that are looking for artists because we're offering them a diverse mm. range of local, interstate and overseas. Brilliant. So along the way for you in, in your role, what has been one of your biggest challenges personally, not mm. so, so much yeah. from the fringe perspective, in, you know, in building this and building, you know, the communications? Mm. And so my career has been, has had a few little, a few different strands, I guess. I'm a big believer in co-creation. So co-creation and collaboration, like collaboration is, is, is something and then co-creation is even deeper level collaboration. When, mm. when, when you go into a co-creation situation, you're more likely to, to not know what might come out of it at the end. Mm. So um, roles aren't necessarily defined as usual. Like you don't just have one leader, one director. It's things can emerge out of out of discussions, things can emerge out of being uncomfortable and not really knowing. Mm. Um, 
Well, that's really hard. Like people don't really like it. Like people yeah. don't want to co-create. I mean, you know, no one wants to be out of their comfort zone. And <laughs> I mean, even if you say, oh, I like being out of my comfort zone, of course you don't. Like I would say that as well. But then, of course, I don't like it either. <laughs> but I'm committed to wanting to do it. Yeah. I really want to co-create. And I have, I believe, co-created a lot of my projects um, where I've, encouraged people that might be sort of more, you know, not really quite ready or experienced enough to be, say, the director or the leader on a project, but in the end they've emerged to be a co-director on Mm. the project. Mm. I love that Mm. thing that, you know, some things are going to come, what's going to emerge? I don't know. Let's have a look what's going to happen. Um, One of the times that, so around about 20 years ago, I was a co-founder in a thing called Crossover Labs and Crossover Labs was all about getting people quite experienced in their career actually to see what would happen, the best of filmmaking, the best of games design, the best of storytelling, the best of interactivity. Sometimes we would have scientists there as well, (laughs) so taking amazing research out of laboratories Mm. and how can you convert that into some interactive amazing project and Anyway, we had this idea it was going to be like, oh, it's going to be amazing, we're going to take them away for five days and everyone's going to learn from each other. And, you know, the whole thing descended into complete chaos until about (laughs) on about the second day. Lord of the Flies. There was like mutiny. (laughs) (laughs) They were like, we're getting out of here. (laughs) And um, anyway, people really were like, why don't we know what we're doing and why, you know, why haven't we got a schedule? And we on purpose didn't write a schedule and we didn't have any like itinerary and people were like, well, I want to go and, you know, go away for a few hours and do some work phone calls and what's the itinerary? And I was like, no, you can't. Like if you're in this, you're in it. If you're not in it, you're not in it. You know, it's five days we're doing it. And so um, the mutiny sort of happened on day two. Then we all had a big discussion (laughs) about it. No one left. And then um, anyway, by about, you know, towards beginning of day five, everyone was in like, crying that we were fin- going to be leaving each other. We were like everyone was thriving. Some amazing projects were born, mm. you know, some incredible collaborations. So so that was a good lesson for me in sit with uncertainty mm. and and actually good thing, like amazing stuff can emerge if you just let that uncomfortable feeling sit for a bit longer. I love that and I love that it's okay to not, yeah, to not know. Mm. And and so the ambiguity, um, learning, yeah, I guess I learned a lot in that crossover lab morning that kind of took me by surprise mm. and then realised that actually it was all right. Creativity in chaos is actually exciting. Yes. Mm. Oh, fantastic. Thank mm. you so much for sharing that story. I really like mm. that. That's great. Well, that's it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing all of this. I'm very excited for the 2019 Fringe mm. Festival. I'm putting my first show in, so I'll be there as a, as wow. an artist experiencing. Have you got that. a venue? Yes, I'm at the Jade. Beautiful. And I'm doing an interactive show as well, so it's oh, all unknown. I amazing. am embracing the creative chaos. <laughs> So I'm inviting people on stage to join me. Hopefully they do. Great. Um, yeah, so interactive, that's the new genre we've just introduced. Yeah. Uh, so is... we're the first Fringe Festival in the world to introduce interactive as a genre. Yeah. And we believe, um, you know, it's a booming it's a booming genre around the corner. I, I yeah. think there's interactive theatre, really exciting stuff happening all over the world. And I think that with Fringe, um, people know that it's a taking a risk. Like, you mm. know, everyone audiences know that in Fringe you just take some potluck, go and see something you don't know. A year later you might realise I'm still thinking about that show (laughs) and at the time I thought it was really bad but why am I still thinking about it? So um, Fringe is all about, you know, spreading your wings, taking a risk and, you know, go and see it, you know, that with the price point being a bit, you know, lower, it's not like the top end of arts shows. It's not the $200 ticket. It's the $30 ticket, the $20 ticket. People can go see a couple of shows a night often. So then they come home and their mind's just buzzing because mm. it's like they've got new ways of seeing and new ways of thinking and the artists have, you know, really challenged them. And I'm sure that's, you know, potentially what's going to happen on stage with you, depending on who so. you get up there. Right, that's right. And who knows? You'll have to come along to find yes. out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so 
so much, Heather. But in conclusion, can yeah. you share with me Heather's Be The Drop tip? So that's oh. your top tip for communicating and building a community around, you know, your passion. I'm a real believer in user-centred design. So trying to think about the audience as much as the idea and how you build it for not not like creating a product for an audience, not like that, but actually putting yourself in the shoes of an audience member of how you might be uh, in, interacting with whatever it is that you're going to create. How do you discover it? How do you, you know, what's the... How did, what's the very first second that I heard about this show? How did I hear about it? How did I stick around interested in hearing about it to one minute reading about it to actually engaging in getting a ticket or going to it or whatever it is? Like that mapping that journey rather than just thinking I'm, uh, I create great stuff and they shall come. Like, um, <laughs> you know, actually really drilling down in how breaking down step by step how do people literally how do they hear about it you know is it realistic are you making a, an assumption that no one's gonna that ever that's not actually gonna happen um yeah you know um and so that user-centered design model i love um and not and not as its own not as the only tool for creating work but as a tool to apply to yourself that you that forces you to really question um, whether the assumptions you're making about this project, you know, stand up. It's it's about being agile and being adaptive, mm. I think. Fantastic. That's not much of a tip, is it? But anyway, no, that was great. It's just a way of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> there was lots of tips in there. It was loaded with gold. Thank you so much, Heather. Thanks. Thanks.